we'll go ahead and get started for today. So today I have the pleasure of introducing Dan Green from the University of Maryland College Park, where he is an assistant professor in their information studies department. Uh, before that, he was at MSR New England. Uh, and before that, he got his PhD in American studies also at, at Maryland. And, and in the, the last couple of years, he's really become uh, an expert in uh, telling us how, how society uses technology to kind of make claims about how organization, uh, organizations are, are, are using that technology to, to address problems in the economy and kind of using the, the narrative of technology to, to, to say how we're solving problems, but really uh, the, the, the problems are much deeper than that. Uh, and, and today he's going to tell us some more about uh, his work in that area through the, the book that he's, he has either coming out or, or very recently, uh, The Promise of Access from MIT Press. And so thank you, Dan, and welcome. Thank you, Daniel. So nice to see everyone today. So many of these things have been um, virtual and in person just because you know, I get to sit around with the grad students and talk and we have all this informal stuff too. It's, it's really great. Um, thank you very much to Daniel for the introduction, um, for Roderick uh, for organizing everything. It's really just a privilege to see you guys here today. Uh, so like Daniel said, I'm here to talk about the work in my new book from MIT Press, The Promise of Access, Technology, Inequality, and the Political Economy of Hope. Um, came out in April, so it's, you know, it's new-ish, I guess, that still counts. Um, and it's, it's based on about four years of field work in different DC institutions that turn the problem of poverty into a problem of technology. So I'll talk for about 40 minutes today, uh, and I look forward to that and, and during the reception. And I want to talk mostly about how we understand this relationship between personal computing and economic security. So why is it that we feel that we must learn to code or else? sense in Gramscian terms is quite strong. I call it the access doctrine. It persists across political parties, geographies, and economic conditions. It doesn't really work on its own terms. So we, we don't actually have a surplus of coding jobs. Uh, there probably isn't a skills gap in the way the Wall Street Journal tells us. But the idea still does a great deal of work in those institutions that prepare people for the labor market or care for them as they try to re-enter it. Indeed, in the last 30 years, places like schools and libraries have been completely remade around this proposition that we can solve poverty with technology. Not because the results are necessarily, because librarians or teachers believe this proposition in their heart of hearts, but because embracing this mission saves institutions that are themselves under threat overwhelmed by the social problems that they face every day while they're perpetually short on money, short of legitimacy. You know, who needs a library if you've got the internet? And it is this process of institutional transformation that teaches us to believe in the power of technology to solve poverty. It is, it is in that way, it is a coping strategy that makes racial and economic inequality sensible and navigable. It provides a script for individuals and institutions to be heard and recognized and sometimes saved. This is why schools and libraries start to walk and talk like startups. And they usually fail in the attempt because poverty is just a huge complicated problem and, and just structurally schools and libraries can't be startups, but they have no option except to try. So after outlining these big show how they play out on the ground in DC's public libraries. Uh, and the book also explores startups as kind of the ideal type organization in the present economy, as well as tech focused charter schools as another urban institution remade by the access doctrine. But some more hopeful notes about the kind of political organizing that can break the tech sector's hegemony, its hold on our cities and our economic imaginaries and remake these institutions. So these posters started showing up in the DC subway system, largely in those neighborhoods still majority black in 2013. Each one in the series declared, the internet, your future depends on it. 
next to a photo of a working class black Washingtonian and their story about using the DC government's digital training resources to get a good office job, um, often after years in the service industry. Uh, so one explicitly says, you know, 20 years as a beautician, then I turned my life around. There's instructions to text for more details. So quote, Sean earned an advantage six months. Now he upgrades computer systems for the US Small Business Administration. He uses technology to help people start businesses. So can you. The people in the posters look ahead to their future, smiling. Quote, Fabian learned Microsoft Office in eight months to write, design, and publish her first book. She's using tech te technology to pursue her dreams. So can you. New skills and new tools lead to better jobs, ones in which you don't work with your hands. But this is not just a matter of bringing single individuals across a digital divide, a gap between those who have internet access and the skills to use it and those who don't. The dream here is much bigger. By changing your tools and your skills, you can drive the economic growth of your city and change the community in which you live. And this language has changed over time. You know, we've gone from digital divides to digital inclusion to STEM gaps to this demand that we learn to code. But the idea that our future depends on personal computing is at least. So Clinton and Gore, more likely someone in their administration, coined the phrase digital divide and promised to, quote, pass on to our children an information superhighway that will help them to live out their dreams. Campaigned against consumer internet taxes by arguing that, quote, it's the flow of information and knowledge which will help transform America. And we gotta make sure that flow is strong. Barack Obama, of course, inaugurated Computer Science Education Week by imploring students, quote, don't just buy a game, make one. Don't just download an app, design it. Ivanka Trump lobbied for education department STEM grants by saying, quote, it is vital our students become fluent in coding and computer science. As an aside, I probably, and several other people in this room probably have this too, dozens if not hundreds of pictures of politicians or nonprofit leaders or business leaders leaning over the shoulder of some poor kid and like staring at the computer. And this has been like a fixture of the press circuit since at least Reagan, like I have a bunch of pictures of him doing this stuff. I gotta figure out what to do with that at some point. Uh, is, there's obviously something there, right? Like it's a genre for a reason. And of course, our new vice president, Barbershop in 2019 asked two young black women what they were majoring in and upon hearing that they were pre-law and poli-sci respectively suggested they learn to code. The internet your future depends on it then is not just a story about individual economic destiny but regional and national economic destiny and this is the power of the access doctrine and from it flows new policy new curricula new degrees new jobs new buildings there are, of course, some problems with this story at a very high level. So by and large, the jobs of the future are not in software development. There are more software development jobs, but most jobs being created, according to the BLS, are in low-wage service work, largely food and health, not requiring a college degree. Nor has the recent economy of the past conformed to this story. So I'm, I'm largely a, a sociologist of organizations and labor. Uh, and there's this great 2013 paper by labor sociologist Lou and Grusky that attaches governments to returns from the current population survey. And they find that it is analytical, critical thinking skills that produce the greatest wage payoffs, not the technical skills that are supposedly so in demand. Of course, the access doctrine and you know, child concepts like the digital divide or the skills gap is ultimately unfalsifiable. You know, even if today's technological training regime does not work, new technologies will arrive tomorrow. And for those interested in shifting the burden of economic transition from the firm to individual workers, they're always gonna demand new skills. Like we're gonna have an augmented reality gap next year. There'll be an internet of things gap after that, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and there have been many people much smarter than me, um, thinking here of like Christo Sims and uh, Peter Capelli, Virginia Eubanks, who have uh, Morgan Ames, I think as well, who have uh, disproved this common sense, shown that this is not how things work, that the real story of poverty is much more complicated and there's a better ways to talk about it. But the problem still sticks around. It is immune to refutation. We keep having this debate in a way we're part of the problem because we keep saying every time we say, oh, it's not this simple binary. 
that just emphasizes again the importance of this binary, the gravity that it has, the fact that it brings us back to these silly terms between people who have skills and people who don't. So instead of suggesting a new way to look at the problem, I want to explain why this is the problem, why we're stuck in this rut, why these are the terms of the debate. In part because it's clear to me that the real lives of everyday poor people do not conform to this story about defeating poverty through technology. So if you saw those posters in the Gallery Place metro station in DC in 2013, walked upstairs and rounded the block, MLK Library, the central branch of our city's public library system. For several years, I was lucky enough to hang out with Ebony, her boyfriend Sean, and their friends Mia and Josie. They were homeless and they spent almost every day in MLK's computer lab. The internet was not their lives, but it was not the promised land of the future. It was just, you know, every day. Sean said that when he first lost housing after he and his father were evicted, quote, the library became my best friend. It's where he made friends, where he got online to chat or play games or follow the news coverage about the occupied DC encampment that he worked on. Quote, I was always a computer man, he told me. There's a whole story in I was always a computer man. It's a story about Sean's hobbies, his friends, the welfare state institutions through which he traveled. He was not left behind by technological or economic progress as those posters might suggest. Rather, Sean used the PC and the institutions around the PC varied life and to claim space in a gentrified city that was increasingly hostile to the working and workless poor and was increasingly segregated along racial and economic lines. Sean was a computer man, an activist, a black Washingtonian, a homeless man, a boyfriend, a library patron, an artist, and much more. I was always a computer man then is both this kind of humble biographical fact and a political statement about the security that he felt behind a screen in the library. That security is what Sean needed most from MLK since it could not provide him actual housing. You know, that wasn't its job. And he largely ignored all the digital training opportunities around him. The library, of course, leaned into the city's version of the access doctrine, the internet, your future depends on it. And as they did so, there was less and less room for people like Sean. To understand why, we have to rewind to the early 2000s. And some of this might seem like the weird political economy of DC where Congress kinds of runs the show, but it's what I wanna emphasize is that that's exactly the same dynamic in, in more heightened terms as what you see in conflicts between majority black cities and majority white versus Lansing, Philadelphia versus Harrisburg, that kind of thing, Baltimore versus Annapolis. DC is just an outsized manifestation of that. In 2004, there was a lot of talk in DC of radically downsizing our library system. And that system had been dealt a very public black eye in March of that year when a virus took down every computer in the system for a month. Today, library officials talk about that as a kind of come to Jesus turnaround moment when they realize just how high the stakes were. Ultimately, this was a symptom of austerity. In 1975, 620 full-time employees worked at 20 DC libraries. But in 2004, only 431 worked at 20 libraries. So far fewer employees, somewhat more libraries. And the library was like most of DC public services, understaffed and underfunded. It's funding reliably a much lower proportion of the municipal budget than peer cities. Budget cuts that Mayor Anthony Williams insisted on as part of the plan to get financial control of the city back from Congress. Again, might seem weird, not that far away from like the financial control board that is imposed on like Detroit or something like that. Uh, what was that? Yeah, the library system then was short on political and financial support and overwhelmed by a homelessness crisis it was unequipped to handle, something which would only get worse as the Great Recession hit in 2008. That month long computer outage was only the most visible sign of these problems. Williams did the mayor thing. He got a blue ribbon committee together on the library system's future. They issue a report. That report concludes, the District of Columbia Public Library must be transformed if it is to be the successful, relevant institution needed and deserved by Washingtonians. Information requires a new service dynamic as well as a new infrastructure of technology and facilities. So the new library is both new stuff and new people. Fast forward 11 years. 
It's March of 2015, and that vision is starting to emerge. I was at the Martin Luther King Jr. Central Branch of the library system with Dave, the mid-30s white man at the head of MLK's digital programming, Sherry, a mid-40s black woman and upper level administrator at MLK, and the Friends of the Library Charity Group, uh, largely white middle and upper class retirees who lobby the library on policy changes, run literacy classes and book drives, that kind of thing. Throughout a presentation in the library's upcoming renovation, our backs were to the glass cubicles that separated the dream lab co-working and presentation space that was usually loaned out to startups from the digital commons computer lab, whose 150 seats were full as usual and dominated by the city. Mostly older black folks, more men than women who walked over every day if they weren't dropped off by the shelter shuttles that also do pickup runs in the evening. Dave, eyes gleaming, asked if we'd like a tour of the new maker space upstairs, a room intended as proof of concept for the proposed renovation, funding for which they were still seeking. So we walked past the librarian monitoring the 3D printer through the Great Hall where a mural of Dr. King was looking down on the techies who were setting up their chairs for their demo series. We go up two floors on the elevator, past one of the video visitation rooms for DC jail, around the corner from the Black Study Center, back into the cavernous stairwell that had been a cruising spot for most of the 80s, through some locked double doors, and into a sunny meeting room. It was kind of reclaimed for this maker space. Its windows look out onto a Ruth Chris steakhouse. And it was hard not to get caught up in, in Dave's kind of hopeful gee whiz attitude as he's printers, the laser cutters, the CNC machine, and the scattered laptops. He pitched the maker skills that the Fab Lab would teach as a new literacy for a new economy, something that could help defeat the STEM gap and provide the creative technical worker he's really short on. Consumers would learn to maintain their devices and save the environment, and skilled techies would have a space to inspire underprivileged communities. One library friend pitched it as a poetry lab that would help save the arts in the 21st century. There's just so much hope in that fab lab in 2015. And frankly, a lot of it was recycled from earlier stories that they had told about the three-year-old computer lab that seemed so far away downstairs where most people spent most of their time and which itself had, had been a massive upgrade from the 14 Dells that until 2012 had made up the main computer lab of the central library branch of the capital of the richest country in world history. There was so much pressure placed on those tools, that room, that library, and those librarians, even though it was mostly used by library visitors, rather than the homeless folks that were there all day, every day, just like the Dream Lab downstairs. It offered a reassuring vision of the future in a city where a flood of new tech workers post-recession was accompanied by a housing crisis and a jobs crisis. So DC saw a 29% rise in the number of homeless families and a 12% rise in total homelessness between 2010 and 2015. We have an active policing policy that keeps about 5% of our city in jail on probation or on parole. We have, you know, of any state, the widest income gap between the top 10% and the bottom 10%. The middle completely fell out of our labor market during the recession. And it is during recession that libraries uh, which are largely funded from local property taxes, are hit extremely hard. They lose exactly the point when they have more patrons with more intense needs than ever before. This makes them particularly sensitive to the needs of politicians and to potential donors. In a very real way, then, the digital library embodies a whole challenges can be overcome with the right tools and the right skills. Indeed, MLK was literally rebuilt around this story of hope, this responsibility for local development. DC public libraries produced this hope as a way of legitimating their existence in the internet era and as a way to manage their role as one of the last remaining safe public spaces for marginalized city residents. This requires massive but urgent changes to the operations of the organization its structure, its appearance, its personnel. And if they failed in their mission, then they had to start over again. 
because the problem was just too urgent. I call this process of constant technological and organizational experimentation in support of social mobility bootstrapping. It is a hopeful but frantic process pursued because it garners resources, legitimacy, and clarity to its many competing demands. But because this mission secures the health of the organization, it must be defended at all costs. The very people the mission is meant to serve are marginalized in support of the mission. Because for the library to maintain this hope and quote, using the technology to improve lives, as librarian Grant put it to me, it must necessarily regulate or eliminate other potential uses of that space. So what does this look like on the ground? This is a joke that one of my librarians, April, regularly made with colleagues whenever she saw patrons talk, fighting with each other, eating, watching porn, touching yourself or a partner, or bedding down for the night on a strip of cardboard in the references. She gave out imaginary stickers as she walked the library to patrons that she thought were using the space appropriately in a wrong. And, you know, to me, there's obviously something extraordinarily condescending, if not pathologizing for saying like the person who may be having the worst day of their life is dumb as paint. But this captures a very important social dynamic within the library. April has a master's degree. She's a middle class white woman who has recently moved to the city for a secure but very stressful job. She can tell you how to verify Google results, do basic, basic HTML, find your nearest polling station come election time. She loves open access and Barack Obama. She's an ideal liberal knowledge worker and her professional identity is formed by a series of confrontations with not that, with poor or working class patrons with only if that, much younger or much older black or Latino patrons who've been priced out of DC housing, patrons of mental illness, patrons who mistake socialsecurity.com for socialsecurity.gov. These were her patrons or customers, as she usually said. And this mission of progressive outreach and its gendered, raced, and classed overtones has been with the profession since at least the founding of the American Library Association in 1893. So white middle-class women in the progressive era worked as reader's advisors, teaching immigrant patrons to move away from dime store novels and towards the classics inculcating sufficient literacy and social capital to enter formal job and housing markets. Today, most of my librarians describe their profession in class and gendered terms as a pink collar one, with April calling them, quote, mavens of knowledge. This mission took a digital turn when the Clinton administration put the digital divide on the agenda, but also pushed the 19th Communications Act, which gives the US some of the slowest, most expensive internet in the developed world and makes libraries pretty much the only place you can get it for free. You know, more generally, like how many places are left in US cities all day in a comfortable public space? You don't have to buy anything. Not only that, but you have a wealth of learning opportunities at your fingertips. Uh, you get free guidance from people with advanced degrees. Like, obviously, the library is the only game in town. Like, I, I think that joke about how if we proposed the idea of libraries today, they would be dismissed as a communist plot is, is pretty true. Like, these are remarkable spaces. And, and much more than that, you know, MLK had, like, ACA signups, flu shots, dance lessons, Spanish conversation partners, this incredible archive of DC punk history, much, much more. But it was also decades overdue for a renovation, and those present needs for a public space conflicted with the library for a space oriented towards the hopeful future of knowledge work. This conflict then was institutionalized within library computing, the rules for it, and the selection and training of library personnel. Excuse me. So there's a lot you can do with a PC, obviously. At the library, the PC was a work machine. For example, Betsy, the librarian teaching intro to BC Basics, emphasized both the skills of how to write and left click, create folders, et cetera, but also concepts, the different names for a flash drive, how deletion works, what she called, quote, the proper language of the industry, 
that would prevent you from being embarrassed at a job interview. She constantly referenced the civil service exam, even if that didn't really exist anymore, even if most students would not be applying for those mid-level bureaucratic jobs anyway. These values were into the library's uh, personal computers and vice versa. So patrons use their library card to sign up for a session at a central terminal. They're then directed to a queue that's on like a big screen on the wall. There were 70 PCs in MLK's three 2015. In 2012, Elena, who supervised the three hour waits for 14 computers at the old popular services lab, told me that even if she had tripled the number of computers, that wouldn't be enough. And she was right, you know, they tripled the number of computers more than that, and it was not enough. Especially in our sweltering summers when, unlike winter, there is no right to shelter for the homeless, then there's hour plus waits for a PC. The Pharos login system not only managed the queue, it also allowed librarians to monitor every session's activity from a central terminal and choose to end or extend that session. Patrons watching porn repeatedly might find a pop-up screen saying, please don't do that. They were not using the library right. Patrons working on a job application online might ask the central desk for extra time and have another 15 minutes tacked on. Staffing decisions are also key here because when you choose the correct librarian, that in turn signals the correct way of using the library. On the one hand, this is the uh, long-term issue about the librarian pipeline. A lot of the veteran librarians that I interviewed really regretted the transformation of library schools into information schools. We see Becca's reading of that shift here while she was getting her master's in library science in 2000 as the tragic downfall of her profession, the embrace of technical over service values. And this means so much to her that there's a bit of projection here because the word science was never in the title of her college even after the name change, but it just like impacts her so deeply that that's part of her story. She was probably the most junior librarian I met who still called her patrons patrons rather than customers. Then there's another filter at the level of local hiring. Um, mid-20s white librarian explains to me here, the digital commons 70 computers, it's Adobe Creative Suites, the 3D printer, the book printer, those glass co-working spaces they loaned up to startups. All that is incomplete without a group of librarians who are young, whiter, and more tech savvy than the branch's veterans. Their enthusiastic startup aesthetic was essential to the space. This hipster contingent, as everyone called them, Performed the link, uh, performed the hope that linked personal computing with knowledge work and social mobility. You know, they looked like the future. They were the source of a lot of debate in the librarians' union since a cohort of veteran Black librarians had been bought of the, out of their contracts right before the hipster contingent was hired for much lower salaries and the digital commons opened. But this story is incomplete, you know. The bootstrapping library had a very specific organizational form for personal computing, you know, individualized, long rows, everybody. But what we might conceptualize as the kind of powerful downward pressure of an institution's production of space is always to a greater or lesser degree resisted or reconfigured by people within it. You know, patrons have agency. So first, homeless patrons, the vast majority of regular library users at MLK adapted to the institution's reorganized space, and then explore how they crafted new places within it. Patrons were well aware that librarians were happy to help fill out social service forms for food stamps, affordable housing, et cetera, and you, know, you pick the right person to work with for whichever task. Most patrons also acknowledged that something like porn was doing the library wrong. You know, Most of it was filtered after all but you could get away with it with a little bit of work. You choose the right site, you switch between windows, you nonetheless keep hardcore porn open in a room with 150 people in it. I went to the library every day for like two years. There's not a single day that I don't go there. There's not one guy watching least an hour by himself in a full room. And we should recognize this takes quite a lot of skill, not just the technical literacy to navigate those filters, but this kind of like, um, social instinct to recognize this conflict within librarians cracking down on you. Because as Rachel explains here, librarians want to preserve the library's traditional orientation towards the free flow of information, particularly for people without other means to access it. 
but they also want to preserve that hopeful future orientation towards knowledge work. You know, you wouldn't generally watch porn at the office. This conflict extended to other areas, but porn was always the first example of doing the library wrong that everyone wanted to tell me about, just as job applications were always the first example of doing the library right that everyone wanted to tell me about. There is a similar patron uh, or similar pattern in patron interactions with the police who roam the library branches. There's a dedicated um, just for our, our libraries. Uh, there's usually five or six of them at the central branch and then one or two at each of the individual branches. Um, they're always, the walkie talkie that they carry is always the loudest thing in the room. They have a control room upstairs to review their camera network. They're allowed for librarians or not. And they tend to enforce norms for sleeping, drugs, fights, phones, theft, or exposure, rather than personal computing proper, unless a librarian calls them in to act as the conservative right hand, sternly enforcing the liberal left hand's rules. Mia, Ebony, Josie, and Sean, uh, part of this incredibly generous, welcoming crew of homeless Black young people that I spent much of those three years hanging out with, mostly in the digital commons, but also in, you know, in classes, standing in line for food or whatever. Um, they were there every single day. If they weren't at like a day program or, or a visit with social services, being poor is very expensive and time consuming. Um, but they have that particular library every day since like 2014, because prior to that, they had kind of jumped around from library to library, fleeing the cops um, who had hassled them for sleeping at the desk, talking too loudly on your phone, whatever. Finally, institutional space, not just for human human interaction, but human computer interaction. They had a whole slew of strategies for getting around that login system. So Mia, before she was gifted a used laptop, would email whatever she was working on to herself before her session ended, run back and grab Josie's library card and start a new computer session as soon as possible. She told me that even if like a generous librarian gave you another 15 minutes, it's not like that was enough time to complete a job application or a housing application anyway. You like you needed to cheat in order to reach your goals. And this parallels how folks share kind of other state issued ID cards outside of the library. Thinking here about like um, what we used to call food stamps or clinic issued Metro passes, that kind of thing. But patrons don't just adapt carve out their own libraries, distinct from MLK's reorganization of its space as a training center for knowledge work. Some of these have to be suppressed, others can be incorporated into the bootstrapping library. There's a lot of play places in the digital My field notes always call a noisy corner was a group of tables and chairs with no desktop PCs. And for 2013 and much of 2014, especially after school let out, it was filled up with loud card games, you know, mostly Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! Friends meet there every day, they cheer each other on like any other sporting event. But that's not you doing the library right, you wouldn't do that in the office. So one of the hip new librarians, Jeffrey, Mohawk, mechanics overalls, um, invites a friend of his who lives in the suburbs outside of the city to drive in on the weekend and then organize official Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh leagues. You give everyone like jackets, badges. They use the glass co-working space that the startups are vacated for the weekend. Problem solved. No more. Also a lot of collaboration here, even as personal computing was designed as a, a fairly solitary experience by the library. Collaboration was obviously encouraged in the glass cubicles in the back of the room where the startups were always loud. Patrons' collaboration looked different. Um, there were drug sales, usually synthetic weed or crack cocaine, which the police cracked down on quite hard. You had these um, guys like hustling on Craigslist to do like multi-level marketing stuff. Um, we had a lot of oil men. You see here, um, black, usually Muslim men. Uh, with little vials of fragrance, either on belts or on their chest, these like little wooden racks they carry around. They're mapping the best neighborhood to make sales during the commute. Cops usually leave them alone. Uh, also a vibrant repairs culture. You know, people trade peripherals. They give each other tips for speeding up an old laptop um, or where to like pirate anime. Everyone came to Mia for that. Uh, but also analog stuff, you know, how to fill out social service forms for maximum benefits, who to visit at which office. But the most important use of the library space, especially for the homeless community, remember last truly's public space in the city is a place for rest. 
a place to check email between dishwasher shifts, to stop after your filters kick you out during the day, to sit and rest and sleep. Because it's 100 degrees out in our swampy summer, neither shelter beds nor the sewer grates above the subway stop next to MLK are quiet, comfortable places to sleep. And, and many psych medications are strong sedatives. And while similar to the porn issue, librarians were conflicted about this, they ended up coming down quite hard on sleeping. Because the fact is you can't sleep at your PC at the office. So you can't sleep at the computer lab. That is not productive. So they patrol, they knock on the desks of people who are napping, calling the police if they don't respond. So we've seen that this hope Library as a digital skill center was not naturally occurring. It had to be produced through this organizing process that I call bootstrapping. And that process required the regulation of emergent places that diverge from the institution's plans. It was literally rebuilt to become a new transformative space instead of the old transactional one. That three year, $208 million renovation project required, as Grant tells me in 2014, admitting that the contemporary computer lab has failed and that it needed to be taken apart and put back together again. The homeless patrons watching YouTube or dozing off in the back did not fit the hope of the digital commons or the fab lab upstairs. And so in the renovation process, those rest places, collaboration places and play places that patrons built were to be physically segregated from the startup workspaces, the seminar spaces, and the transformative technologies at the heart of the new library. Bootstrap the problem of homelessness much more manageable. You know, you knew who to kick out of the library and who to let in. It also provided the library path to legitimacy when it was under threat. And this was an uneasy process because this vision of how the world is supposed to work conflicts with the librarian's historic sense of purpose, as well as patrons' own agency to reshape the space. You know, and librarians were happy with getting the renovation. It was decades overdue, but we're quite upset with how the kind of prototype features of the uh, renovation that we talked about previously have played out. They were especially distraught at how the city government seemed to just have no plans for homeless patrons who would lose this community space, you know, effectively the largest day shelter in the city while it was under construction. Hundreds of people were redirected to a day center in an industrial park on the city's edge, like four bus stops away, it's like New York Avenue, if you know DC. Um, there's, you know, next to the dump and the, uh, you know, car mechanics, strip club, all noisy stuff that you don't want the rest of the city. There's no restaurants, no jobs, like nothing near social services, much less public transportation. Uh, plans for a downtown day center never materialized. Librarians, to their credit, hustled to get resource pamphlets together for patrons. Um, it was hard to overcome the divisions that had been previously built between librarians and patrons. There was this, this trust gap. Um, homeless patrons and the Fens of the Library staged a protest on the day of the closure. I took some pictures of here. Um, but it was clear the city government had just rolled right over them, and they did not have the power necessary to resist. The library actually reopened a few months ago, but because of COVID, it doesn't have the same life to it yet, so I don't feel right drawing comparisons. What we see then is a new bootstrapping institutional culture that has replaced older public service cultures as the economic, political, and technological environment has changed. This story is not unique to MLK or even to public libraries. In the book, I draw on organizational sociology, specifically neo-institutionalist Air MLK with a STEM-focused charter school in order to craft new organizational theories and formalize the methods beyond or mechanisms beyond bootstrapping. So, you know, what causes these repeated attempts to solve poverty with technology? Why do libraries and schools end up looking like Apple stores? There are three overlapping pathways. First, the meritocratic model. Middle-class helping professionals, majority white and plurality black DC believe that the skills training that we had that led to our labor market success is broadly replicable. We worked hard, we went to school, we picked the right skills, we got good jobs. You know, even if we know in the abstract that much of our organizational and individual success is owed to structural factors or, or sheer luck, we know that in the back of our heads, our profession still mobilize our biographies as a tool for uplift. 
the helpers help the helped on their terms. That's what I do as a teacher, right? We have all these fancy theories for how education works, but at the end of the day, what I'm saying to students is that you're going into debt because this guy, you know, he got a good job, he went to school, he learned this stuff, he's gonna take this stuff out of his head and give it to you, and that way you're not gonna starve. That's what April did with those stickers too. Second, here, bridging organizations present active professionals or professionals in training with tech sector models. The examples of startups and tech workers is made readily available and in some case required to follow in order to secure grants and other resources. Um, so iSchools right now, you know, for example, they train librarians alongside database engineers. Uh, recall MLK's hipster contingent. This is not like a, a statement of malice. It is just saying like, you know, there are different ways of training librarians than there were 40 years ago. You're presented with different examples of what success looks like. Elsewhere, Teach for America and the Brood Institute train new teachers and new administrators and network existing ones by importing business and management language into schools. The officials in DC city government are all Brood Institute alums, and that is in no way unusual for a big city. Third, mission ambiguity. So attacks on institutional finances and legitimacy and the collapse of other portions of the welfare state leaves these institutions overwhelmed and under-resourced. Solutions are unclear. Recall those debates about what to do with people sleeping at MLK. Focusing on skills training and tech provision makes all of these complex problems much simpler. And it demonstrates activity to powerful stakeholders who might, excuse me, relieve pressure on your organization by, you know, for example, funding your renovation. Together, the meritocratic model, technological professionalization and mission ambiguity push schools and libraries from public service to bootstrapping. But this is not a clean break. People are still there to help and be helped. And so these institutions with creating specific people for specific economic conditions, what Marxist feminists call social reproduction, are riven with contradiction. Some spaces are saved to produce a new workforce Others are disciplined or destroyed, expensive, or produce the wrong kind of people. Such contradictions determine the terrain of struggle, but not its outcomes, you know, the rules of the game, but not the score. In order to end the cycle of bootstrapping, by way of conclusion, I want to say that helping professionals must build power alongside people punished by this cycle in order to re regain control over our public institutions and to use them as a staging area for a broader fight for liberation. Socially reproductive labor is often less of a strategic priority in radical politics, um, not least because that work you know, in hospitals, schools, or at home is often done by women for low or no wages, but it is an extraordinarily important not only because it must occur and it cannot be outsourced, but because it brings together the struggle of workers who are fighting against degraded working conditions and the struggle of the community they serve, who want to reclaim the care and the space that is owed to them. This unit is justice unionism. It is a tradition long held in American libraries, like these Contra Costa strikers above, who are saying that they serve communities, not institutions, which is an interesting sentiment. And it is an organizing strategy that has seen an upsurge in 21st century teachers unions in particular, in large part to ensure that they have the overwhelming support of their constituents behind them. The Chicago Teachers Union is probably the best representative of this philosophy today. After the radical core caucus won leadership elections in 2010, they turned the union towards actively organizing existing members and the community. They made a whole organizing department that built reading groups, knocked on doors, held cookouts. And, and this wasn't just for membership, but it was for students, families, neighbors, everybody else. This ensured that when they struck over contract negotiations in 2012, working class Chicago understood that teachers' working conditions were students' learning conditions. And they were striking for the city against the wealthy who were in classrooms and replacing veteran teachers with TFA scabs. Management lost their best talking point. Greedy unions hurt kids. Rahm Emanuel continues his assault. He closes more schools. The conflict peaks again in 2016. And what's remarkable of that, about that is the contract that comes out of that fight when the teachers win 
does not just preserve their pensions and their wages, but it diverts some of the city's real estate development fund into schools, which is like absolutely unprecedented. We also saw it in Los Angeles when teachers struck not just for working conditions, but for an end to the over-policing of black and brown students. And it is this collective unity between helper and helped that defeats the uplift narrative driving institutional bootstrapping and presents an alternative life beyond the atomized competition of the access doctrine. Instead of a vertical relationship where I'm gonna give you the stuff that helps you survive, this is a horizontal relationship of solidarity that recognizes that our struggles are not equal, they're not the same, but they're connected to so we need to rely on each other. The failed protest over MLK's closing showed that these bonds were not yet strong enough in DC, but librarians across DC and the rest of the country have begun organizing to protest their budgets and lives during the pandemic. So there is that possibility in our schools and libraries already. And this all might seem pretty far afield from the struggles over personal computing that we talked about before, but those struggles were at the heart of the recent wave of teacher strikes. So, you know, cloud computing surveils us at work. West Virginia teachers were furious that their health insurance plans required them to wear Fitbits to monitor, um, to, you know, price out their premiums. Uh, redesigning our institutions to offer security beyond competition is going to inevitably require redesigning PCs, our queues, our Wi-Fi, our security, and our more. We're going to have to literally rebuild our spaces. And this is, after all, the original meaning of participatory design, you know? That was a framework not designed in research labs or corporate focus groups, but in Scandinavian manufacturing. Workers demanded a say in the design of their factories and their products. And with that in mind, I think we can build different libraries, different schools, different tools, different people, a whole different economy. So I hope that I've shown that the story driving so much of our thinking about poverty and technology, the internet, your future depends on it, does not appear out of thin air. It has to be told over and over again. It has to be reinforced through web filters, progress reports, grant applications. These are coping strategies that we built to make economic inequality sensible and navigable. But if access today means fundamentally an opportunity to compete, then an alternative should not be so hard to imagine. Because if the world as it currently exists is one where we must be granted the tools necessary to strive for, to innovate beyond our current dire straits, to outcompete inequality, then surely another world is possible where innovation is boring and excellence is unnecessary because the good life is. So I ask, what would we compete for if so many of us would not starve for losing? because we have quite a lot of work to do. Thank you. Everybody all at once. Um, and we can also take stuff from Zoom. I just can't see it right now. Yep, yep, I'm not on mine. Thank you. Thank you so much for the talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I think I have two questions. Mm -hmm. Like one is that, um, you know, I clearly see that the educational institutions like public library and uh, schools are being the center of like the post production of this system we just learned about. And that, um, um, any other types of institutions are performing as that kind of post production institution. I think. That's uh, the first question. And then the other one is I actually uh, read this line from your book saying that um, you didn't really mention about like startup models, today, sure. but um, I think you said like startup models are being the idea form of institution or organization for public libraries and schools nowadays. While we all acknowledge that the goals and visions and the, the purpose of the, um, those institutions are pretty distant from startups and I was wondering this argument, whether this argument was coming from like your interviews with librarians who already kind of internalized that startup or that like part of your theory that the startups being manifested as a idea form of organization to achieve your goal. Yeah, that, that's um so the questions are like what are other places, uh, other sites of social reproduction where this what is the kind of um, role of startups as the ideal type in, the, in this space? Um, 
I mean, so methodologically, the thing you ask again about whether this is like method or theory, like as uh, or data or theory, like as a good Marxist, there is no difference. Like the uh, if I am not uh, building my conclusions out from like the actually existing world, and my theory does not like move is not like an object of analysis in that ex actually existing world, and does, does not emerge in that actually existing world, and I'm not doing a good job. Um, so I'm, yes, I'm explaining things through the currents as I observe them, both in this kind of like policy history that front ends the book, as well as the, you know, four years of ethnographic field work and the, I don't know, 70 people that I interviewed repeatedly over four years. Um, and as far, I, I think you can answer both those questions together because like, there are lots of places where we make people. You know, there are, we're in one of them right now. Another one that we could think of in contrast, which might also be on this campus, I don't know, is like a hospital. A hospital is um, a place where you literally keep people alive, you take care of the next generation, you literally create the next generation. Like that's what my wife does for a living. She's a lactation consultant and a nurse. Um, and there are lots of austerity pressures on hospitals right now where they are forced to make money and act like businesses. Um, and they are sites of struggle. There's a massive ongoing strike of, of nurses in Western Massachusetts right now. But um, they're not pressured to change their organizational, excuse me, they're not pressured to change their organizational model in exactly the same way as schools and libraries. They're not forced to change what they're doing in part because their function institutionally is a little bit different. So schools and libraries and universities, certain kinds of nonprofits, certain kinds of social work um, are kind of absorbing shock absorbers for the labor market. You know, As people are thrown out of the labor market, you take care of them and help them get back in. Or as people get ready to enter a scary new labor market, you prepare them for it. And that's, that's not exactly what hospitals do. Um, these places that do feel these pressure, like schools and libraries, uh, you know, what I draw from in the book is that like the startups have been forced on them as an organizational model for largely the reasons that I talked about at the end, like the uh, method of success that startups are supposed to indicate is presented to them in their training. It's something that they were required to follow in um, pursuing their uh, funding or in pursuing like authorizing their charter in the case of charter schools there's certain thing politicians want to see um, it is something that is a very simple thing that they're presented with in training where you get like some brilliant tech ceo giving the keynote at your teachers conference um, very good and when you have a million problems to deal with that sounds like a very sensible way of moving forward that's something that happened over and over again where i kept seeing like ed tech people keynoting like teachers associations meetings and that kind of thing um, and none of this is necessarily malicious, but it's just because like the pressures that these institutions are forced to and the duties that are um, placed on them are really, really difficult. They're looking for anything that could be a life raft that could help them hold on. So even if the people working here, librarians, teachers, social workers, university instructors, know that the world is a very complicated place and that things are not this simple. We also know that there are certain words we have to say, certain things that we have to do, certain degrees that we need to offer so that we keep having a job, so that we get the support that we need to keep the lights on. So it's not this kind of conspiracy, although there is like, absolutely, like our, our cities are being eaten alive. There are like not spaces for the people anymore. But like that, that conflict continues over and above the motivations of individual greedy people or evil people. There is this kind of like abstract compulsion that exists at the institutional level over and above any individual desire to accumulate. Yes. Hi, Daniel. Thank you for a very wonderful presentation of your work. Um, I wanted to hear your thoughts on a global scale. Um, I'm an international student. I mean, this comment was gold, right? Borders, um, dedication to study at um, international law school. Um, so I wanted to hear from you what 
what are your thoughts about the comments on access when it comes to global economies in different countries to affect it? Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so the question is, um, you know, how, how does this travel? Which is always an inter interesting question for someone whose PhD is like literally in American studies. Um, but, uh, and, and I also wanna lift up the work of um, someone like Morgan Ames, who is like um, specifically in, investigating like the politics of development in this space, like ICT for D. So I, I think like Morgan's book on, on one laptop per child is, is a really important text here. Um, even our questions are not exactly the same, but we're, we're you know, converging on the same discussion. Uh, and, I, and I do take lessons from like critical scholars of development, um, like uh, Arturo Escobar or Jim Ferguson or, or people like that who talk about like development that like ties people together. Like the digital divide is supposed to be something that takes people from one side to the other. And in reality, the digital divide as we hope we've shown here is a, a way of thinking about poverty that like maintains that particular system in its particular shape, development politics work in a similar way. Um, what part of the story that I'm telling here is that there are particular political economic conditions that come around after the wheels fall off the bus in the 1970s for whatever reason that you want to talk about, you know, like the, the I don't know, the OPEC, the gold standard, the crushing of the union movement, the New York going bankrupt, whatever. For whatever reason, there's a the political economic system completely changes in the 70s. Um, and we have a whole lot of folks who are surplus to requirements in the information economy. Part of that we deal with through a massive um, policing and prison program, the, the likes of which there has never been seen in the world history before. Um, so we are literally in the problem, um, not just for people who uh, would not be able to get jobs, um, but for people who would probably be in the streets protesting or, or joining radical organizations. Um, and that story is very attractive because it, it makes a certain amount of moral sense as there's bad people, they're a problem, put them away. The story was so successful that the Democrats were kept out of power in the White House for several decades. So you have this brief blip of Carter, but even that doesn't really count. Uh, and then Clinton gets back into the White House by not just picking up on the punishment, but telling a much more hopeful story about what to do with folks who are on the outside of the economy. And that's the story that I've told here, where it's, it's not that we have to put people away because they're a problem. It's that the internet connects everybody to the global labor market. So wherever there is internet, there is opportunity to compete, opportunity to skill up, and that's what's going to drive tools and skills. And they're gonna do that through a, you know, a deregulated neoliberal regime that is, uh, you know, says that like the most competition for offering these public services uh, is going to get the most of it to the most people. You know, this is why we have such terrible. Events. But nonetheless, that is their theory of change. This becomes an extraordinarily attractive political program. And it's the things that like gives new life to the Democratic Party in the 80s and in the 90s. It brings together um, a new series of donors centered in tech and finance, people like John Scully, um, you know, MCI, uh, Apple, stuff like that, um, Goldman, notoriously. And it also brings together a new set of voters who replace the multiracial working class of the New Deal coalition, which was always kind of like barely held together. And instead, we have a new bunch of people like me. You know, you have, you have professionals who are highly educated, uh, who work in an office not a trade, they're not unionized, education helped them rise up the ranks, care very much about equality of opportunity. So they're very, um, they're gonna protest like, you know, uh, unequal housing or something like that. They're not really down for redistribution, especially if it affects them. So like two-way busing to integrate schools, never gonna happen in your neighborhood, never gonna happen. Um, and that coalition is held together by this promise of access by saying like, this is the way that we're gonna change the world and solve problems. And this is a long way of answering your question because I think like this program holds where those political conditions hold. And it's not gonna be as attractive in places that don't have those same underlying political conditions. So when I've given this talk in, um, in uh, Scandinavia, they recognize some of the stuff happening with libraries where there's been like a, a lot of creative ferment to change what libraries do. But the stuff that I'm saying about schools doesn't make as much sense. 
because they don't have the same funding mechanisms for their schools. Their schools are not as being destroyed like ours are. I think often a mistake that Americans make in comparative politics where we think like, hey, we're a big rich country. We should compare ourselves to other majority right big rich, big, rich countries and see how they're doing. In, in fact, we're a big poor country that just happens to have a lot of rich people in it. And our comparison for us is always Latin America. We look much more like Brazil or Mexico than we do Germany or Denmark. And I think it is in those spaces, especially in Brazil, that I've had the best conversations about, yeah, this, this looks much more like what local governments are being prepared to do. This looks much more like the, represent, um, the connections between like, you know, civil society and NGOs and law and order politics on the other hand. So it's, that may be like kind of a vulgar way of looking at it, but I, I think like it's where these political conditions hold, this is gonna be the way of holding together that third way coalition and dealing with the problem of poverty where these political and economic conditions do not, I don't think this coalition will emerge. I don't think this way of solving that problem will emerge. Are we at time or do we, can we keep going? Or? It's up to you, man. If there's one more question, we can take it. Otherwise, yeah, sure. I just like to, uh, I, I thought it was interesting to the question or just uh, think from you a little bit more about. I was intrigued by your uh, on first sex for the topic. I really enjoy doing this work. I was intrigued by your sort of invoking a certain square design mm -hmm. and the, the sort of Scandinavian experiment with that. And the way, one of the things that strikes me about it, and, and sort of maybe somewhat naive in my own understanding of it, but the successes, at least in part of the, the success that it had was not because, or, or at least was, it was a union mm -hmm. driven effort. Yeah. It was something that came out of one institution working uh, sort of in opposition. And the story that you're telling feels a little bit like a large institution with a bunch of individuals who are, don't have institutional power. And I'm wondering what the path forward you see is, is for how to build that institutional power that might give them the platform for which someone could do something like the big story design. No, I, I think that's a, it's a brilliant question. I, I think it's the most important question that we can ask right now. This is actually what I end up talking to the grad students quite a, a good amount about before this. But um, Yes, the Scandinavian tradition is, is primarily about unions acting like unions within their larger union federation to, to spread around best practices. I think similar things can hold here in sites where like socially reproductive labor is highly organized and that is like true in most, excuse me, in most schools and, and many libraries. Libraries end up having a kind of a different fight because they're often in federation with a larger union that includes people that are in conflict with their goals. So like if the DC Public Library Union local wants to start kicking cops out of the library, that's gonna run right into the fact that their union includes a lot of prison guards and making life hell for them and start it inside the, um, the council. Ask Me has this weird thing where it's in councils instead of nationals. Um, so there are some internal challenges there. But I think what I'm what I'm hoping to gesture towards in that conclusion is that you know beyond the kind of like what we in labor studies we call the newsies principle that is if you strike you're a union you know it doesn't matter what it's called like if you act like a union you're a union um, that one of the ways to build power in these institutions is not through abstract discussions about like you know what do we want it to be how can this happen where should the money go but through these very concrete conversations about like, okay, are people allowed to sleep here? Uh, where should the chairs be? How long should we wait on the queue for a new computer? How long should a session be? Like those are the kind of things that can start this social justice unionism conversation where you have, uh, you're not just organizing workers, but the community around them. And it gives you a concrete point around which to discuss that stuff. And that, that's where I see a lot of this like, the radical potential of HCI and design, especially is like, it gives you a, a concrete kind of thing that acts as the tip of the iceberg for larger social issues. And, that, and that's how I encourage my more like design oriented students to think about this stuff. So thank you, but that is extremely important to ask.
All right, uh, I, let's thank Dan again. <laughs>